Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, proceduralism for games. Short answer is yes. Um, I'm Christos Tavridis. My name is Christos Tavridis. I'm a technical artist at SideFX in the labs team. We make open source tools inside Houdini that help artists with their workflows. We have some uh, big projects coming in. I don't want to spoil that. Uh, I, Danica just came here. It's, she's my fellow labster. So tomorrow, 12.30, she's going to talk about what's happening in labs for everyone who might be interested. Um, and also, this is my animal companion, Ombre, and he's kind of the theme of today's uh, presentation. So one thing I came to realize is that no matter how much time I spent petting him, playing with him, being his loyal servant, is that uh, he always wants more of my time and attention. So the big question is, how do I save time and energy? And um, also, what does that have to do with proceduralism and games? And I'm glad you asked. Uh, but first, um, what is proceduralism? So the way I see it, proceduralism is a, is a non-destructive way of working, is a, a way of preserving your information and you don't have undue history in, of sorts. So you can make changes anytime and have a different end result. It's also a rule-based system. You can kind of play mini-god uh, with uh, taking the context itself into consideration and building uh, uh, rule-based systems and simplifying repeated manual work. And if someone sees that, it might feel like a spaghetti of nodes uh, in most of the um, um, times. So why use proceduralism? Um, again, it's a personal thing, but it's first is to save time so and reduce grants. And I'm doing that for Oberyn as well. And also survive sudden death. And sudden death is my way of saying changes in production. So I got that from a game called Worms, where you know, all, when it's sudden death time, all the health of the players drops to one, and you know you can die by sneezing. So <laughs> it's kind of the same feel when you're in production and you have changes coming on. You're like, ah, what do I do now? Um, so using procedural systems is a way of minimizing the cost, minimizing the cost of changes, and. Um, I had so many great uh, talks with artists, f uh, fellow artists, and it's taking into consideration craftsmanship, uh, where, you, where you want to do that handcrafted work, but also you want to save your uh, time and uh, automate processes as much as you can. So again, it's, it's not about having that in a meditative process, but it's being in a production environment when you want to save time to pet your cat. Um, Procedural tools are uh, great for uh, iterative pipelines. They are great for uh, prototyping and exploring. Um, uh, also, again, taking craftsmanship into account and automating processes, getting rid of the tedious manual work, uh, generating a huge amount of content and variations, and also handle massive workloads. Um, it's kind of an investment for, for people that are not there yet. It's an investment which returns long-term benefits. and. Uh, I'll bring some different examples, and uh, yeah, it's more of an eye candy thing. So an example that encapsulates all, all of the above is uh, Project Titan, which is a demo learning uh, project created by SideFX and a talented team of artists. So the goal here was to create a beautiful procedural environment all the way from concept art, tool building, to a polished result in UE5. And the, the great thing about that is it was uh, all a team of six person, persons, and uh, it took the actual production phase of the project took about two months, and there were 20 tools that were built for that specific project. Uh, these are four of them, um, four of the 20 tools that were built, and um, the artist here uh, wanted to have also artistic control over tools, and that's kind of a misconception when it comes to proceduralism. Uh, if you have artistic control, and the short answer again is yes, you do. It's how you build that system and uh, what are the rules that you're setting up. So uh, I don't want to go into much detail when it comes to that project. You can find that online. Uh, but the key thing here is that you use different uh, easy uh, to use input methods like uh, curves, boxes, building blocks, things like that, to save the overall form, have different variations, and uh, it's a way of uh, having guides and quick visualizers 
uh, to see the final result. And also set dress your scene or set up the scene. This is a, this is a time lapse for uh, the iteration passes. And you can see that is a quickly block out for a level design and environments. And uh, again, with procedural tools, you can get the broad strokes right and before crafting the details. Again, it's easier and more flexible to iterate and uh, cheaper and faster to progressively refine. Uh, another project that was, again, a small team was uh, The Ascent by Neon Giant. Again, it's an Unreal game built by a, much, by a much smaller team. I think it was a team of 10 or something like that. Uh, it features an incredibly detailed lived-in world using clever modular and procedural workflows. And it's a great use case of interactive, easy to use tools made for environment artists again. Like uh, you do want to have artistic control, you want to have the environment field uh, lived in, and you, we can see that in that project as well, in that game. Uh, one of the tools that were uh, uh, developed for that was the Room Maker tool, which is, uh, you can see that it uses block out boxes as input to define the room spaces, and you can either add or subtract uh, boxes for the block out. Also, it populates the outlines with uh, modules previously built and defined uh, in a JSON file. And has advanced features to populate the environment with debris, cables, and decals. Um, so, again, procedural systems fit naturally with modular workflows, and uh, you can easily create a large amount of uh, module variations. And, uh, you can automate modular assembly with rules. Another great tool is the cable floor, uh, which is used for generating cables on floors and draped over and selected geometry. It's used inside Unreal by drawing a spline, and then you, know, you can use vertex coloring and UVs to generate and drive materials. The Pipe maker tool is, uh, which is actually two tools. It's, uh, it, again, it assembles the modules uh, along an input curve inside of Unreal. And it also populates the curve with modules that were, again, previous, previously built and defined in a JSON file. And that's the other tool, which is used inside Houdini and generates the mass module set. And this is a complete set of 34 pipe modules from a base profile. It also generates the JSON file, which then is used inside that real. And uh, again, UVs and vertex colors are used to drive the materials. Uh, another great example when it comes to interactive, easy to use tools, uh, which are made for environment artists, is uh, that one. And we can see how laying down a road automatically transfers the biome around it. Uh, a great example by Dean Scott, which is here today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, here you can see that procedural systems uh, are, can be used not only for background or environment assets, but also to build hero assets or assets that are likely to have a lot of design changes. And again, are easier and more flexible to refine. So for, for example, for generating the stovepipe, uh, you have a curve, which is the main structure of the pipe. You can use a recipe to produce different variations. We can see uh, 15 different stovepipes being generated here. And these are being used by a process called wedging, which is a way of creating attributes to control parameters like uh, the angle and then generating different variations. Uh, this is a great uh, pain point for environment artists, which is uh, to uh, create images, to generate um, optimized mesh cards from images. And here's an automated process uh, generating cards from the foliage from an atlas. So the actual way to do that is to trace the pieces from the opacity map and draw some curves, flood fill the selections, remesh them, and run a for loop to pick its piece and center it and generate that. So what we can see here is that manual work takes too much time for doing many assets. And these are not too many assets, but you know. Uh, so you want to build a creative uh, workflow that cuts through all pipeline pain points. Another great example of using uh, Houdini to analyze geometry and use data to help you create a rich layered look is uh, <clears throat> splitting the tree scatter into three separate scatter systems of points, uh, which allows for a much finer control. And that's being done by uh, splitting uh, based on convex or concave curvature of the underlying surface and uh, by upward facing points. And 
that helps with the placement and shading of the leaves. Uh, here's another video where uh, there are some changes being made, like orientation or scale, to groups of geometry. And again, this is too much of a struggle if you want to do it manually or hand place everything. So you want to be smart about it and uh, automate uh, as much as you can. Uh, another example inspired by Resident Evil 7 and Condemned. This project was done over 12 weeks and procedural tools were used here for set dressing the scene and also building up layers in the environment. So these are two of the tools that were used, uh, which is to create different cobwebs, build the wallpapers, place trash bags, break the plaster, things like that. And um, this is the time lapse of the evolution. Uh, here we can see that the tools allow for to quickly try and quickly try out different looks and uh, as the artist keeps evolving the scene. And Houdini is extremely useful for iterating quickly and building tools to, uh, for creating variations again. I could not not include my baby in this presentation, so here's Hexagona, uh, which is, uh, I, I got inspired from uh, board games, uh, especially Settlers of Catan, to have that procedurally generated board. So there are parameters for shaping the landscape, the sea level, the color palettes, and even scattering of foliage and uh, rocks on this one. And again, it's, it's all about getting to have a recipe and reusing that recipe to generate uh, different results, different variations. And you can do that just by changing sliders, actually, which is pretty cool. Um, variations happen early at the base grid stage, so that's a, a very easy way to generate those variations. And the output results are different, but visual consistent. And again, it's uh, very easy to create LODs. It's uh, very easy to create uh, collisions and uh, proxy geometry and things like that. Um, another cool example is um, uh, that one from Nordius, from uh, Nicola. And uh, when talking about variations, do you go and handcraft each one of those? Short answer again is uh, kind of, maybe yes, maybe no, but the artist here wanted to have a future-proof generative production workflow. So uh, he wanted to remove unwrapping, texturing, rendering, all from the production process. It's, again, trying to automate the process and fake whatever they can. Uh, we can see that a bus has two elements, which is a contextual main element, which is the a high poly model rendered out as a height map, and a generated background element. And it's all about combining those. The advantage of this workflow is that they could utilize any height map and uh, generate different maps from Geo that they could reuse. In the end, they combined approaches and found a nice sweet spot. And it's all about automating repetitive tasks and making a recipe and reusing it to do that. Uh, once workflow is established, you can create huge quant sorry, quantity of assets with beautiful varieties and consistent quality. Um, when it comes to changes, again, uh, you want to minimize the cost of changes when you're in the sudden death setup. So um, that's a great example of that. Because in production, uh, the decision to change may be up to the designer and not uh, entirely up to the artist. So a produ sorry, produ procedural system can ensure that there's always updated content based on design changes. So the artist doesn't have to spend too much time redoing manual work. And instead of that, time can be invested in improving the tool, and that provides long-term returns for your investments. Uh, this is one of the tools that was made for that project, which is, um, we can see that um, the snow mass depends on the rocks. So usually, set dressing tools are often dependent. So here, you, we can see that changing one thing, which is the rock mass, can impact many other things, like the snow mass. If the snow is hand modeled, then the rocks get afford to change more than a few times. And another great tool and example is that from quick and dirty brushes to you can go to nice baked out results. So you hand played mess, hand place messes to block out the landscape, and then Houdini ingests those block out messes and outputs terrain, which is then you know eroded to add realism, and you have all that snow building up. And the cool thing about that is, based on the input, the terrain will update accordingly when you know editing the, those block out messes. <clears throat> um, 
Another world building example when it comes to terrain, <clears throat> you usually need lots of assets. And uh, here's an example where we have uh, uh, layered, layered rock cliffs and ledges with procedurally scattered stones around the base. Uh, the aim here was to have a few assets that could easily be kit bast together to create a large section of, of an environment. Here's a cool example by doing that. Um, so the basic technique is to take the base shape, which we can see on the left, and slice it horizontally and vertically, randomly offset the slices and create some distortion. After that, create a skirt of sand and debris around the base, and finally generate a low poly UV mess for baking and texturing. Uh, by the way, we have big head and flip uh, scratches for anyone who might be interesting there. Um, that's more of the final result. So in the end, you have a workflow that would create a final textured rock formation from a simple base mess. And that's the end result. Uh, we can see that artists can craft the details, such as the look and feel of the rocks. And technical artists yeah, can use low poly shapes to art direct the layout. And you're able to visualize the high res result. Another similar um, example is that, where the procedural, the cliff props were procedurally generated using Houdini. And this is kind of a breakdown where you have a few basic shapes on the top left that are being processed through a network and you produce a highly detailed final mess. So it's all about automating the process and again, key thing, maintaining artistic control and direction. Uh, this is another example where you have a kind of a big scene with uh, different buildings and foliage that uh, serve the same recipe to build variation. So, all the buildings here, all the sakura trees, everything is based on one recipe, on one HDA. And an HDA, uh, which is a sort for Houdini Digital Asset, is, uh, is kind of the recipe which you can use inside of Houdini. You can also use them inside of a game engine to uh, fine tune or change with the sliders different parameters. They are kind of rule-based systems that you build. And you can expose attributes to control different parameters, play around, get different variations, and cherry pick what you want. And you can do hard surface modeling as well as organic modeling, and uh, do architecture as well as foliage. Again, we have some uh, big projects when it comes to that with uh, labs. Please make sure to uh, come to Danica's presentation tomorrow. Um, last but not least, <laughs> I'm sure everyone's aware of that. Uh, this is the Matrix Awakens demo from uh, Epic Games. I, I don't want to go to deep, uh, deep dive into that, but I encourage everyone to go check everything about this project, uh, Tech Art uh, Marvel. So it was built using mainly procedural systems. And uh, again, you can generate a huge amount of content. Uh, and without this level of speed and scalability, Finishing a project of this magnitude on time may be extremely, extremely challenging. And one of the good use, use cases of Houdini is that it can handle massive workloads and you can use high throughput processing. So here everything is data driven, but again, that doesn't mean that, that you randomly scatter elements. It's uh, the placement of, of assets should always make sense and uh, be uh, context aware. Last thing, uh, and a very important thing for people that know me, I'm all about organizing everything. Um, with a project of this magnitude, uh, you can, it can be hard to keep things organized as the project develops. So again, with procedural tools, you encapsulate work into modules. You can, they are easier to clean, validate, and keep consistent uh, across the team. It's easier to rework, build upon, and create libraries with. And instead of having a spaghetti of nodes, you can have something that is more clean like that. And that's all. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, some time for questions. I'm not very, it's not very easy for me to look, but <laughs> All right. Oh.
So the world ideal goes with, uh, is dependent on, you know, your needs or your studio needs. So I, I, I'm not sure about the ideal, but one way of working is to have the mess, which you can uh, get it inside Houdini or generate inside of Houdini. And uh, you can create different LODs or you can create a low poly version of that. You can transfer, transfer UVs and the bake out maps and then export those uh, as, uh, I don't know, textures or use them uh, in a, another software or again inside of Houdini. Um, you can also bake uh, information for vertex colors if you want to use that inside of uh, as information inside of Unreal for uh, blending materials or things like that. Um, you can do lots of stuff actually. It's, uh, it depends on what you want to do. When it comes to uh, managing um, or processing assets, uh, it's, uh, you can automate almost everything. So if you have a, uh, a base asset, which you don't want to maybe use the high poly for nanite or whatever, and you want to go through the uh, optimization process, everything can be optimized. So you can do almost everything you want. That's the, that's the short, short version. I hope that's the answer you were looking for. Anyone else? Are we good? Okay. Okay. Thanks so much.